as Jessica said, I am a teacher. Um, I teach elementary school, and you guys are way bigger than them, so this is, this is a little scary for me. Um, this is definitely something that is very out of my comfort zone, um, but here we are. Um, so, um, again, school teacher, so I'm going to set my timer, so I will shut up at some point. <laughs> Once upon a time, so many of our stories start with these four words. Once upon a time. They're filled with anticipation, excitement, and maybe even an expectation of a princess being rescued by her Prince Charming when she's found herself in a hopeless situation. Maybe her evil stepmother has her locked in a tower has given her a poison apple, or allowed her stepsisters to torture her and walk all over her, like she's even a slave in her own house. Each of these stories continue in their own fairy tale way, and each of these stories end with the same words, and they lived happily ever after. As a little girl, I dreamed of my happily ever after, and my home once upon a time. I even dressed as a bride for Halloween, at least once. I was always looking for my very own Prince Charming to come riding in on his white horse to rescue me. Once upon a time, I found him. We are connected by a very dear family friend. We are connected by a dear family friend. And he was the one. We started dating long distance for a while. He was in North Carolina in the Air Force, and I was here. Joshua and I were happily married on June 23rd, 2012, after a year and a half of dating and months of planning. As with any other fairy tale wedding, next came the happily ever after part, right? Well, sort of. We were indeed happily married. And we were blessed in so many ways. We had our first child, Josiah, in March of 2014. And he was a daddy's boy. Joshua and I began looking for a home to call ours. And soon after, we found it. We had everything together, and things were finally falling into place. And we were going to close the week of Thanksgiving in 2015. That was our plan. But as I have learned earlier in my life, my plans don't always happen. For better or for worse, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Words that we all say when we get married. The promise I made to Joshua, and I meant every word. At 31 years old, a mother to a one-year-old, our precious little boy, my vows to Joshua were complete in the till death do us part part. Thursday afternoon, November 19th, one week before we were to close on our house, one week before Thanksgiving, Joshua lost his very silent battle to mental health. A battle that I, his wife, didn't even know he was fighting. At 31 years old, my happily ever after crumbled as the world around me was so suddenly turned upside down, and I earned a name that I never imagined I would wear. A widow. Me? A widow? At 31 years old? I'm way too young for that. That can't happen to me. You see, I needed Joshua. I needed him to raise our child. How can I do this alone? This is not what I signed up for. It is not supposed to be this way. But you see, something I didn't know was the average age a woman is widowed in our country is 57. That means that there are some that are older, but there are some that are much younger than that in order for that to be an average. So here I am, 31 years old, a widow. 
It was this way. This was my new reality. This is my story. Single mom. I left work that day and went to my parents' house. They'd already made sure that I would come there and not go home. In the minutes to come, our church family started flooding their house and making sure that we were taken care of. Josiah was taken care of. People brought paper products, you know, toilet paper, paper towels, things for company that you don't know that you have to have. Snacks, meals, and even just sat, sometimes not saying anything, because those are the important things. God is bigger. I don't know how right now, but God is bigger. God is in control, and he will provide. Those were the words that were in my head as I sat in my parents' floor. I vividly remember this being my thought. God is bigger. God is bigger. In the moments to come, I began to understand how important it was to fill my heart with scripture. Not in that moment, but in the years before tragedy struck. Because these were the words that came to my heart like a flood and brought that peace that transcends our understanding and a comfort that I have no way to explain other than God. The words of God, all things work together for good for those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. When my heart is overwhelmed, Lord, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Psalms. Peace. Be still. God is my refuge and my fortress. In him I will put my trust. You, O oh Lord, are a shield around me. You are my glory and the lifter of my head. Songs I often listen to on the radio echoed in my head. When peace like a river attends my way, it is well with my soul. Words that we might not know in the moment how it's going to be well with our soul. But it is. And in the eye of the storm, Lord, you remain in control. See, all these verses and all these songs have one common thing. God, God is there when life is impossible. And now my life was impossible without God. But there's good news. My story is not over. And with God, it is very possible to continue the race. And with God, I am not alone. Psalm 91, 11 through 12, promises us that God will send his angels to guard us. And with their hands, they will bear us up. God surrounded me. God sent his angels in the form of the church family and my family. Of course, I don't know how the chapters would, to come would be written, but I had complete faith that my God would provide. And boy, did he ever. I was surrounded by my family. Josiah and I moved in with my sister and her family in their three-bedroom house, there were now seven of us living. Our church families cooked for us for weeks. Christmas came, and Josiah and I were showered with gifts from churches. My school family, our seniors, got together and gave Josiah the biggest Christmas that I could ever imagine. Countless friends 
past and present, made it financially possible for me to stay home for work for a few months without having to worry about anything. Text came with the simple words, I'm praying for you every day. The first year and all the anniversaries were the worst. They were constant reminders of things that would never be. Celebrations that didn't happen. Josiah's birthday without his father. Even in all these things, I was never alone. I even got to spend my first on anniversary at Disney World with my family. Um, that includes Joshua's mom. She spent it with us too. The days passed and turned into weeks. Weeks into months and then into years. During this time, grief came in waves and five years later, it still does. But I grew. I grew emotionally. I grew spiritually. I became more independent than I already was. That's not necessarily a good thing. I learned I can do the hard things. I reconnected with friends that I've grown apart from. I reconnected with friends from college. One of those friends and I began dating. This brought challenges to at first. I knew that dating was perfectly fine, but I still felt guilty at times. On our first date, I remember pulling over on the side of the road and sobbing because this couldn't be the right thing, right? But God says it is. This man I was dating was a man that I knew in college. We would have never dated them. We were very different. My prayer, though, was to help me know when I was ready for a relationship and lead me to the right man, not just for me, but for my little boy, to help me raise Josiah to be the Christian man that he needs to be. And God had a plan. Was God's plan death? No, from the beginning, that was not his plan. But sin came into the world, and so death is part of our life. And his promise remains. In all things, God works together for good. In all things. Not after the bad, but in the bad. This man that I was dating had been praying for me too. I didn't know he was praying specifically for me. But he had been praying for a Christian woman who had children the same age as his niece and nephews so that the cousins could grow up together. God had a plan. God had been working in Joseph to prepare him for me just as he was working in my life. I was able to build a house in the country, and I moved in in December 2017, two years after my world fell apart. Joseph proposed in January, and we were married in July 2018 at Faulkner University, where our story began so many years before. God had a plan. God is working all things together for good. Joseph and I now have two little boys, a seven-year-old Josiah and Jake, who is six months old. We are blessed to have eight grandparents in their lives, not including the great-grandparents. Our family is one of a kind, for sure, but they're ours, each and every one of them. It is such a joy to look back over the last five years 
and visibly see how God is moving in my life and therefore the people around me too. Like the popular poem, Footprints in the Sand says, Lord, you said once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed during the saddest and most troublesome times in my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why, when I needed you the most, you would leave me. And he whispered, my precious child, I love you and I will never, ever leave you. During your trials and testings, when you saw only one set of footprints, I carried you. Well, let me tell you how true that is. I understand this in a very real way now. I understand the verses that speak of the peace that passes all understanding. Both are <clears throat> things that I cannot really put into words other than simply by the grace of God. I've learned I can do the hard things. Hard things challenge us to grow, and we are not alone in doing these things. I've also learned along the way that we're never alone. Now, widowhood can definitely be lonely, but you're never alone. God has been faithful to his promises throughout this whole journey. Along this journey of widowhood, I also got to know a new friend. A friend I've heard stories about, but I never really knew who she was. And you see, she and I have something in common. Widowhood. Our widow stories are very different, but I have learned something from her especially about the providence of God. Once upon a time, once upon a time in the land of Moab, there lived a woman named Ruth. She was married to one of the sons of Elimelech and Naomi. Now, we're not quite sure which son she married, either Melon or Chilion. This family moved to the land of Moab to escape a famine that had plagued the lands of the Israelites. And within the first five verses of the first chapter of this story, all three men die, and all three women are left widowed. Naomi heard in the fields one day that there was again food in Bethlehem, and she decided to go home. That would have been quite a journey, and they couldn't just jump in their cars and go. So she was going back from the land of Moab, back to Bethlehem. Her daughters-in-law followed her. Naomi, though, having no means to provide for them, urges them to go home to their mothers. Orpah listens and leaves, but Ruth. Ruth, she chooses to stay and go with Naomi. <laughs> Ultimately, she chooses God, the God of the Israelites. We hear nothing more about Orpah, but Ruth. We know her story is not over. Ruth. No, her story doesn't really begin with Once Upon a Time. But it does really take place in a land far away, especially in the beginning, this land of Moab. It does also have a happily ever after, but not in the fairy tale like way. So, why study Ruth? Ruth teaches us several things. Ruth teaches us about the providence of God, God is in control. And he is working in our everyday lives, no matter what the circumstances are. Romans 8.28 tells us that in all things, God works together for good, for those that are called according to his purpose. 
Secondly, we can learn about the importance of church family. Ruth wasn't alone. She depended on those around her, including Naomi. Faith. Ruth had a lot of faith to continue her journey with Naomi instead of just giving up and going back to the land of Moab. And most importantly, maybe, redemption. <coughs> this redemption through Jesus, even though this is in the Old Testament. Moab was a pagan nation founded in sin. We read about this in Genesis 19, um, verses 30 through 47. Now Lot went up out of Zoar and lived in the hills with his two daughters. This is after Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed and their mother was turned into a pillar of salt. Um, verse 31. The firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old and there is not a man on earth to come <coughs> to us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve offspring from our father. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father. He did not know when she lay down or when she arose. The next day, the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay last night with my father. Let us make, drink, let us make him drink wine tonight also. Then you go lie with him, that we may preserve offspring from our father. So they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him. And he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus both of the daughters of Lot became pregnant. And the firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. Three verses into this story, we're told that Elimelech dies. Back in Ruth chapter 1. And Naomi is left with only her two sons. The sons found wives in the land of Moab, Orpah, and Ruth. Even though that was against God's law, especially from the land of Moab, they were cursed. Deuteronomy 7, 3 through 4, tells us, Furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them, nor, excuse me, you shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons, or taking their daughters for your sons. For they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you, and he would destroy you quickly. Deuteronomy 23, verses 3, tells us, No Ammonite or Moabite may enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation. None of them may enter the assembly of the Lord forever. So the Moabites were cursed. They were founded from this land of sin, and they were not accepted in the house of the Lord. The boys and their wives, along with Naomi, lived in the land of Moab for about 10 years. And then the sons died. So Naomi was without her sons and without her husband in a foreign land. For a woman at this time, this was the lowest of the low. She had nothing. She would be basically left very vulnerable with no social, political, or economic status. She heard that the Lord had visited his people and gave them food, so she decided to move back to Bethlehem. Ruth chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord visited his people and had given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth 
started out in this journey to Bethlehem together. And then Naomi, as I said, encouraged the girls to go home. Ruth 1, 8 through 10. But Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the, deed, uh, with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, and each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But there would be nothing for them in Bethlehem. They couldn't just get jobs to take care of themselves. They, being women, were dependent on the men for the basic things that they needed to survive. Widows without children were often given to slavery, prostitution, or even death. Naomi was going home hopeless and very bitter. She even changed her name from Naomi, meaning pleasant, to Mara, meaning bitter. She was a grieving widow and mother and could not provide anything for these women. According to the law of the Leverite marriage, in Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 through 10, another son could take the place of a lost husband. But Naomi tells the girls in verse 11, she has no more sons to give them. And they would be better off without her. She is empty. Orpah chooses to listen to Naomi and goes home, back to the land of Moab, and back to the gods of her people. Sometimes we're faced with choices. One road leads to the easy way out, and the other leads to God. Orpah chose the easy way out. But because of this decision, we never hear of her again. She is forever forgotten in history. But the story is not over. Ruth chooses to stay. Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Ruth tells her mother-in-law that she will continue the journey with her, but more importantly, she will accept the God of the Israelites as her God. It's here that we begin to see God's plan begin to unfold. It's not an immediate happily ever after. Ruth still does have quite a journey ahead of her. But one step at a time, one day at a time, God works through her because she chose him. God's timing is always perfect. I think it's a little bit early, but I think we can stop there for a break.